Herzlich willkommen beim Café Stillpoint. Wir gehen in die neunte Woche und wieder einmal haben wir das Thema Geschichte der Osteopathie auf dem Programm. Schon bei den vergangenen, äh, schon bei den vergangenen Sendungen kam immer wieder ein Namensspiel, wenn es um genaue Details äh, ging von, von Geschichte. Sowohl Christian Hartmann hat ein, sagte ein, zweimal schon, wenn du das genau wissen willst, dann musst du Jane Stark fragen. Äh, Raphael Segarra Parodi vorige Woche hat gesagt, ich bin kein Historiker. Wenn du, das, wenn du genaue historische Details äh, wissen willst, dann musst du Jane Stark fragen. Heute haben wir Jane Stark äh, zu Gast bei uns. Die Verbindung nach Kanada hat ein bisschen länger gedauert und, und war ein bisschen schwieriger, aber wir haben sie jetzt online. Ich freue mich sehr. Jane hat, äh, hat ihre Osteopathieausbildung am Canadian College for Osteopathy absolviert in Toronto und dort später dann auch äh, begonnen zu unterrichten. Und schon, von, schon während des Studiums und für ihre Diplomarbeit war Geschichte ihr, ihr großes Thema. Und sie hat sich da zunächst einmal auf Andrew Taylor Stills Leben gestürzt und da Stills äh, Sichtweise der Faszien und Stills Zugang zu den Faszien ausgearbeitet und da auch ein Buch darüber geschrieben. Und dafür ist sie auch bekannt in der osteopathischen Welt. Aber in den letzten Monaten und Jahren hat sie sich einem anderen großen der, Gründer, der Gründerväter zugewandt, nämlich William Garner Sutherland und dem und seiner kranialen Osteopathie und hat da eben eine, eine Biografie von Sutherland fertiggestellt, den ersten Teil zumindest, wo es um den jungen Sutherland geht. Und zu dieser Biografie äh, wird sie uns heute ein bisschen was erzählen. Hello Jane, glad to have you online, despite all the challenges we had with the, with the technology. I just, in, in German, I just introduced you briefly to, to our audience. And it seems that, for, for, uh, in, that in your curriculum, you were quite, quite early on drawn to the history of osteopathy. How did that come? What, what, what did your history in osteopathy stem from? Uh, just an interest in following up with what I learned in the classroom. I remember taking a, a fascia class and I said, well, you know, maybe I'm going to go read osteopathy. I'm going to read still and um, see what what he, the real story was, mm -hmm. and I started to read it. I couldn't understand it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we, we, no, we, 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 all, we all got to the, up, up to that point. <laughs> the, uh, there was no words in his lexicon, in his vocabulary, that I heard the instructor say. Like mm -hmm. there was no comparison at all. So where did he get that? vocabulary, the lexicon, the vernacular, how did he, where did he come from is where I wanted to start with so that I could put some context with what he was doing and relate it fast forward to what we're doing now. What's, what's the connection between then and now? And that's all I've been doing. And what, 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 what made you keep on digging? Oh, it's so interesting. And I, It was interesting, and uh, each time I dug, I found another potato, if you wish. <laughs> uh, same thing if you look in, in a garden, you can keep finding rocks and rocks and rocks. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that made me happy. That made me happy. And what I was able to do was take a rock from here or a potato and a potato and make a stew. Like mm -hmm. I could make something from it. It wasn't just... Uh, little pieces of information, but I could see how the pieces of information could fit together into a nice package. So the closer I got to putting information together, the more I needed the detail that would connect mm -hmm. them. Yeah. So it goes very well with a, sort of an obsessive compulsive um, mm. personality. <laughs> so that, 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 that helps with, with any that kind of it. research, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, and I, 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 you, you were, you were mainly uh, focused on still for, for, for quite a few years, weren't you? Yeah, what, was, what, what made yeah. you change? Are, are you, are you done with still? No, not at all. Um, first of all, we just have a finite amount of time in any one given day or week or month, mm -hmm. or year, and as it turned out now, decades. But um, 
I heard you mention Yolandis. Yeah, he asked me to write a history book. And I said, you can't write a history book without talking about the three who I consider the kingpins, the big dudes mm -hmm. in osteopathy, which was still Little John and Sutherland. Mm -hmm. So then I started with uh, Little John. And he was pretty fascinating. I got a, I got a long way, but I, you know, it's all little rocks all over the place. They're not in the mm -hmm. studio. And then I started looking at Sutherland, and I realized nobody knows anything about Sutherland. And he's the one that we probably incorporate the most, Still Point Cafe, um, in our daily practices. Not only that, but it's been taken outside of osteopathy through the upledgers and everybody else. Yep. And the millions of patients who receive care based on what um, Sutherland did. So it's gone way beyond osteopathy, and yet nobody nobody knows. I mean, if you're listening right now, ask yourself, do you know when he was born? Mm -hmm. Do you know what state he was born in? Do you know his parents' names? Do you know, do you know what year he went to school? Do you know anything about mm -hmm. him? I'm when I was when I was thinking about uh, tonight and talking to you tonight, there was one song that always came to my mind from you know Sam Cooke's song. I don't know much about history. Yeah. So so I I wouldn't I wouldn't know any of the of the details you've mentioned. Although I've been teaching a, 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 the cranial approach for quite a few years now. So so where did you dig up the information? What were your sources? Was it just the museum in Kirksville or? Well, no, no, they don't have very, very little bit, very little bit. Mm -hmm. um, can I remember what I did first? I went on a website called Ancestry.com. That houses all the census records from the United States that mm -hmm. the Mormons transcribed. And they had a chat box if you were looking for somebody so after many i don't know if it weeks or months i finally connected with an existing oh. southern relative mm -hmm. so his great nephew and the great nephew knew some other great nephews and one existing aunt mm -hmm. and from them they had some unpublished manuscript that they had wow. written um, just amongst themselves to share as family genealogy i'll hold up this book this uh, with thinking fingers, you know it, mm -hmm. um, Ada. Yep. What I'm writing about in my book is what's covered in her first four pages. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's um, lots that she didn't include, didn't remember, um, didn't think was flattering. I'm not sure why it's not in the book, but mm -hmm. for instance, if you're writing a biography about your husband, would you not write down the name of his first wife? Probably, right? She didn't say he got married. She said he ended his bachelor days. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very choosy on what she wanted us mm -hmm. to know, right? So uh, she dropped some names in the book. And between that and the genealogy and the manuscripts, I started going. I uh, was interested in where the name Sutherland came from. So you're going to see that on the presentation. Mm -hmm. I was interested where William and why was he called William and Garner? I was able to find that out. A uh, very interesting story. And um, the newspapers.com is another website uh, that you need a subscription for. You can look in on there for under Sutherland. Not all the newspapers are online, but some of them are. Nothing in Kirksville is online, so his entire life in Kirksville is not notable or knowable without going there. And I was just there in March before the whole world came to a crashing halt. I snuck across the border just in time to get home. <laughs> and I visited a little tiny town called Mapleton, which is really what the family called home for about 15 years. Uh, they had a newspaper... Um, from 1938, which was reminiscences of Sutherland's days in the newspaper business. Mm -hmm. So from there, he, he actually told a lot. And I followed up on all the newspapers, so we know where he worked, I know what he did, which is what I want to share with you today, and certainly in the book, because it's only um, by 
those mysterious years, which I swear she didn't put more than two sentences in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, from age of 12 till age of 25, when he was working in the newspaper industry, um, that he gained his ability, his pre, um, what's the word I want to say? Pre-ability, that's not the word I'm looking for, but his aptitude to be able to be a good palpator and uh, seeing a mechanism. But I'll, I'll try and show you that today. Mm -hmm. And all that. So everything in this book is uh, about his life up until the moment that he walks out of the American School of Osteopathy with his D.O. in his hand. And then he starts his career. So this is all pre-cranial. There's no how-tos or how to squeeze mm -hmm. head. It's only just getting the thought in his mind. But he also didn't just, you know, the stork didn't deliver him. He, he got here somehow. Right? You can't go back to the Big Bang, although that's when it started. But I tried to go back as, as far as I could and still keep it relevant. Mm -hmm. Nice. Maybe I'd like to add something to our listeners, which I forgot in, in, the, in the beginning. Uh, Jane is happy to take your questions anytime. So please use the chat window. Uh, either below our, our video uh, window or on the right side. Please use the chat window to type in your questions and we will try to integrate them and, and Jane will try to answer them uh, even, even while she's talk, talking, even while she's presenting. The more of a discussion this is, the more of a, a chat this is, the, the better it is and the more interesting it gets for everybody. So Jane, let, let, let's let's switch over to to your slides, and let's see what you uh, let's see all the rocks you you got it together. I think I think you got them opened already. We just have to switch. So uh, subtitle of the journeyman. Now that doesn't translate well into uh, German. I'm it's a little it bit of a, of a journey, but a journeyman is distinct title that one earns in the newspaper industry. And William Garner Sutherland was able to earn that title. So his life can really be divided into sections of decades. Um, from the first 27 years is what I'm going to talk about today and what I talk about in the book. And then from 1900 to 1953 is his whole entire life as an osteopath. Um, the first 27 years are his youth, his work experience, and his education, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today. Um, the next decades were sort of a period where he didn't want to think about anything that he learned in school other than being an osteopath, but this idea of the uh, disarticulated skull was something he wanted to forget about. The next 10 years, he was trying to discover whether the cranial bones could work. Then he started experimenting, writing, teaching, and then he finally retired. In there, he had a first and a second marriage, as I just mentioned. But he had a life, um, or ancestors, I should say, that brought him to the place where he was born. So we want to start there, um, in northern Scotland. So you have here a picture of Scotland. I hope you can see my mouse, Raymond. Can you see the mouse? Yes. You see the map? Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, Scotland is divided into shires or counties. And this one up here is called Caithness. And this is where his great great grandfather, Robert Sutherland, was born. Uh, even before that, great 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 grandfather here uh, in Little Town in Scotland. But this was a really depressed area. It was called the Highland. It had been previously evacuated to um, bring on some more uh, industry. It was called the Highland Clearances. People were pushed to the shorelines. So his great-great-grandfather was making shoes up here in about 1775. Um, and it had the name Sutherland. Now, Coincidentally, not coincidentally, but the name Sutherland uh, came about in around the 13th century, the first person named 
Sutherland. And it was only because the um, Norse people were invading from the Orkney Islands and the king wanted to defend Scotland. So he assigned somebody to defend it. And when he successfully defended it, he gave him that land. And it was south of the Orkneys. So even though it's in northern Scotland, it became called Sutherland. And this is a Sutherland castle where the first Sutherland lived and the last Sutherland still lived there 27 or 28 generations. And yes, I visited it. It's in Northern Scotland, but our Sutherland is very, very, very unlikely that he descended from this line of Sutherland because the other option of getting the name was simply to take it because it was a prestigious name. And if you wanted to call yourself something, you could take it. So who knows how far back that happened, but they took the name Sutherland. In um, 1777, now probably 20 years old, although we're not exactly sure, the great grandfather opts or decides that he's going to join the British army and fight the Americans in the War of Independence. So the, the Americans were looking for their independence the British thought it was a revolution. So depending on who you talk to, it's the Revolutionary War, the War of Independence. And this was really a way of getting out of Scotland, having a job and a little bit of money. So they came over to America on a boat and somewhere while he was in the army, he married and had children. Now, how that's possible, um, we're not sure women were permitted on the boat. Sometimes, um, well, always as cooks, as cleaners, as nurses. Um, if you weren't already married uh, and your one of your comrades died, then you could take his wife was another possibility and they could have children. So that came uh, for a while. And then in the ground, uh, 1783, when the war ended, there was a few choices. There were two choices. Go back to Scotland, or the British government said, you know, you want to stay in North America, we'll send you to what will soon be called Canada, and we'll give you some land. So this picture that you see now is New Brunswick. It's in eastern Canada. The state of Maine is beside it, and Nova Scotia would be down here. And they took land up this river called the Nashua, no, sorry, sorry, St. John River, Nashrack River, to this tiny little black spot here, uh, which was a land grant. So I'm going to show you what that looked like. This is blown up the same picture. The river runs through it. Each soldier was given this tiny, tiny, tiny little strip of land with the river in the middle. And the man who who plotted all these got 580 acres of nice land and all the soldiers got about 62 acres. So Robert Sutherland ended up here. He had to farm, but they weren't even allowed to take the trees because the British still owned the trees and the trees were to make sails and blah, blah. You know that story. So he had children. He had a son called Robert Sutherland, so Canadian. Robert Sutherland had a son called James. Uh, Canadian, so this is William Garner Sutherland's grandfather, and then here's Robert's, or William Garner Sutherland's father, Robert. Canadian, just like me. Now, let's put them here in New Brunswick, and look over here right in the state of Maine. In the state of Maine, in these two little dots, were other homesteads. So from Americans. And these were the Smiths and the Stevensons. And believe it or not, the border between these two countries, between Canada and, and the United States, was disputed. So sometimes these people lived in Canada and sometimes they lived in the United States. And you see that on the census. You wonder how could they live in Canada and the US not know where they were born? It's because they were fighting here over the border. But both of these families from both sides were looking for more land. The area in New Brunswick was a horrible place to live and the area 
in Maine had already been farmed about 200 years, so they were looking for more land. So this is going to be a whole picture of North or of the uh, United States here, but uh, from from New Brunswick, the Sutherlands took a boat, and from Maine here, the uh, Smiths took a boat, and then a train, all the way across to Chicago. And they were headed for Wisconsin. So this is the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I live right there on the other side of the lake. And if you blow up Wisconsin, they were headed first stop um, Dane County where they picked up supplies and then north to Portage County. So everybody was going to this place called Portage County and in particular to Belmont Township. Now, a typical township like Belmont in the United States is made up of 36 squares, each square being one mile. For you, that's 1.6 kilometers. So everything that's square, that's why we think so well in the box here. It's hard to be uh, think outside the box when you live in a box. Each square was numbered, and then you can find out exactly where everybody was living in these sections. So the Sutherland family was living here, and the Smith family was living here. Robert Sutherland is there. Dorinda Nickerson Smith, a daughter, they are look less than two miles apart, maybe two and a half kilometers apart. These Warrens and Lincolns, the, these are grandparents. So they're, they're all supporting each other in the new world. So Dorinda and Robert meet. The reason you don't see any pictures here is because I'm saving for them for the book and I don't want to put them on the internet yet, but you'll see lots of pictures. So here's another blow up, Portage County and right beside it, Wapeka County and two townships, two little squares side by side, each square being 36 square miles each square having 36 squares. Here's the Sutherland property, and here's some of their relatives. So Dorinda and Robert get married in 1869, and they start their life uh, over here in, oh, I can't read it right now, another county. Uh, they move to rural, so they're only, if you can count the squares, about eight miles away from their, their father and mother, their parents. Uh, the first son is born in rural. Do I have a picture of him? Oh, here's a bigger, better picture. They start their life in Dayton. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight miles away. Um, they move to rural. And this is where the first son is born. They end up moving to Parfreyville, to Crystal River. This is going to be a pattern throughout their lives. Somewhere, William Garner Sutherland was born, but nobody knows where. They don't know if he was born in uh, rural Dayton or over here in Belmont. We know when he was born. The question is, do you know when he was born? The answer is March 27. 1873. So the day is uh, not in question, but the place is, and there's no record of his birth certificate because neither township is required to keep records past 1909. So we don't know where he was born. Um, I put these other pictures on here because we're going to see him move from Wisconsin to Minnesota to South Dakota and then to Iowa and then to Missouri. So this is just an idea where the area that we're going to be looking at. Firstborn was Steve, like we talked about. William is next. Let's see, William here. September, I said 27, sorry. Yep, so March 27. 1873, he lives 81 years. Here's the next um, state to the, to the west, 
Minnesota. So Robert wants to keep moving for more land. So they move now, sorry, to Minnesota. So they've crossed over from uh, from Wisconsin to Minnesota. They land here first in Winona. That's the wrong picture, sorry. Here, here's Winona. This is it blown up. This is the Mississippi River. So all along this border, if you can see my mouse moving, Raymond, is the Mississippi River. That's not easy to cross. In places, it's a mile. So once you cross it, you, you only try and do it once. And it's a big deal. If you read Andrew Taylor's Phil's autobiography, um, he talks about what it was like to cross the Mississippi River. Sutherland doesn't talk about it. Sutherland doesn't talk about anything. He's really quite invisible at this age. Uh, this was a place in Winona town, uh, County called Saratoga Township. And so remember, it's 36 squares. I've taken squares 17, 18, 20, 19, 29, 30, 32, 31. Uh, the numbering is crazy. It goes like a snake. So that's why these numbers are um, not in sequence. But he lived down here in this little section 30, and here's where he had fun. He has a few memories here. He's got an older brother who's sort of tough and uh, robust and a little bit bossy and very adventurous. Um, still doesn't have a younger brother, but I think the younger brother is born here. So the two boys play. I think they set a barn on fire by accident trying to cook eggs. And Robert acquires some property for once, or lots where he built a house, built a blacksmith shop. Uh, they're just getting stable and for whatever reason, poof, they move again. This was a story of their life. He was constantly on the move. So now with William about six or seven years old, they're off to the next place, um, which is, sorry here, Blue Earth County, which is this part of Minnesota. They stay uh, at a place called Eagle Lake. And here, Dorinda, the mother, describes it as so bad. Their roof is leaking. They put pots and pans to keep the beds from getting wet. It's really not a good place, <laughs> not a good place at all. Um, where they eventually would end up living is down in this little dot called Mapleton. And so it's only about six, four miles away, but that will come later. And much later in his life, he ends up working here for about 20 years in Mankato. So this is the home county. This is the home base here. But he doesn't get to call it home yet because the father is on the move. And now we're going to jump from Minnesota, uh, Minnesota over here to South Dakota. And when they go to South Dakota, uh, they land. Uh, Sully County, right in the middle of South Dakota. Now, this is Excuse not me, Jane. Yeah. Just a question here. What, was it customary at that time and in that area that the families moved so much, or was this exceptional for the Sutherlands? This was exceptional because what you what you wanted to do was get 160 acres of land and farm it. Mm -hmm. and make a home and make a stable home. So there was nothing normal about what these guys were doing. They relied on the goodness of um, the brothers and sisters. So I think Dorinda had 11 brothers and sisters. Robert had six or seven sisters and a brother. And they were all a little bit more successful and they were all scattered. So everywhere they went, they were actually being taken in first by another uh, family. Ah, I see. That's already there. Um, you know, I don't have time to tell you all this. But, but um, their, the their destinations had, were not completely random, but they moved yeah. from one relative to another. Yep. Yep. And they, ha they had to go. So now Robert on Sully County here has taken what's called a, a land grant. So he's he's actually paid a little bit of money. He's got his 160 acres, which is a standard farm. Um, I'm trying to think how to 
divide that into hectares for you. Um, what's the ratio? A little bit less than half. So maybe 60 or 70 hectares of land. Mm -hmm. I think that's the... Um, but it's not good farming country. It's just dirt, really. And you had to stay there for six months, erect some sort of little shack uh, the size of um, like a one-room place. There's some really bad pictures you can look up called Saudis, S-O-D-D-I-E-S. Nobody wants to live there. But if you lived there for hmm, how long? Six months? Then it was yours. Then you had your land. So he tried that. The family was living down here, the rest of the family, in a little town called Blunt. Let me see if I have, no, I don't have the picture. You might see it later, but there's a little town in Hughes County called Blunt. Um, it had only been formed about five years before the Sutherlands got there. And now the third, the final um, child here is born, the sister, who is uh, Helen. Now, Helen married late had children late and alberta is her daughter and alberta is still alive and alberta and i have been talking so alberta is sort of the living link to what the sutherland family but the william garner sutherland had one daughter and the daughter has no children so there's there's no descendants direct they're all kind of off to the side by cousins and aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews. At this juncture, um, they have to decide, the family have to decide. I mean, they really are destitute. They have no money. So they make a deal, uh, which was common to do back then with a newspaper uh, company that take, take our son and take him for four years and teach him a trade. And that's what they did. They gave Will to the newspaper industry to become an apprentice. And that was with the blunt advocate at first. So here, this is what it would be like as an apprentice. You're called a devil at first. Uh, everything that um, goes wrong is your fault. You get all the dirty jobs, cleaning out the stove, sweeping the floor, picking up letters off the floor. Um, but in four years, you're rewarded with a trade. You become a craftsman, you have a job, and uh, in the meantime, you get food and clothing. So this is what happened to Will. You, William was more like his mother, I think. They both had blue eyes. He had uh, blonde, curly hair. He was a little bit roly-poly, he called himself. Uh, didn't have that interest like Steve did in or the older brother and working in the mill or being an um, engineer, fixing things. He, Steve, the older brother, was more like the dad. Will's more like the... Um, the mother. So he takes this job at 12. So you can imagine what, what is your son doing at 12 years old? This is a full-time position now. Um, one of the papers he worked at, as you can see there, is called The Blunt Advocate. Now, do you remember if you fast forward in time and you're reading William Garner Sutherland that he called himself Blunt own bill when he first started reading writing about the cranial concept because it was so crazy he didn't really want to identify himself so here's where the blunt comes from bone obviously he's talking about bones and bill is a nickname for william so it makes perfect sense blunt bone bill but not if you just pick up contributions and thought and say what the heck is this <laughs> blunt bone bill yeah so this little guy here is trying to put letters into a stick. And I'm going to show you what he's doing with the agency of grown-up. A grown-up is called a compositor. So this is up here. He's got some text that he's reading. And he's got to pick letters out of these boxes, put them in a stick, and make a newspaper out of it. Um, let's see. He picks up with the letters and they have to go in upside down and backwards. And some of the spaces uh, are those pieces that he's picking up is the size of a hair. It's so little. 
but the font they're using in newspapers, uh, especially with numbers, with tax reports, is four-point font. And the smallest you would usually even type a letter is 10 points. So it's, it's half that size, and it's on a piece of, I didn't put the, the block in, but the letters, um, very small, <laughs> that's what I can say. You put all the letters together on a stick, upside down and backwards, um, reaching the whole time. So your, your uh, proprioception is amazing because you're re reaching into one of 96 different compartments and the fastest compositors can reach, um, I don't know, I think 4,000 times an hour they reach into this box. So you have to memorize where the letters are and they're not the same for different fonts. They're not the same for different newspapers. So it's really quite a, a skill. And then when you have them all together, you have to get them out of this stick. And this is where he gets his first haptic perception. He's got to hold this block of loose um, type without dropping it like the apprentice did. So if you squeeze it too much with his thumb and his finger, it will, the word is pi, P-Y, it'll um, bend and crumple. You have to keep your third fingers bent. Can you see how he's got them there to hold that, that um, type in place until it's transferred to a, a galley. So he slides it onto this galley. So, so this is how he got the idea for a CV4 technique, right? <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, it's really interesting about the CV4, but not for, not for today. Then all of the, the font is transferred to the square thing called a case. So the font is here in the middle, for instance. They lock it up with called furniture. So all these terms I had to learn, and you'll have to learn, because they're not used the way we would normally use them in English. This block is called a furniture. And then you tighten here with something called a coin. This slides, locks this in place because it's open on the front and the back. So if it's not locked properly, it just falls apart. Then you lay that on a very, 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 very flat surface. And this is where it becomes interesting. Those little pieces are 0.918 of an inch. 0.918, I, um, one one thousandth of an inch is 0 0.025 millimeters. So the difference between 0.918 and 0.919 is 0 0.025 millimeters. He's got to take his hand and go over the surface of all these fonts to see if there's a high spot or a low spot. Because if there's a low spot, there won't be any ink. And if there's no ink, there's no print. So he's learning now to feel evenness. And this is really important for his early osteopathic work because in the early osteopathic work, he was feeling for expandedness or um, physical expansion, not PRM expansion, but a physical blown up side of the cranium or a kind of caved inside. So imagine learning it to one one thousandth of an inch or 0 0.025 millimeters when you're only, let's say, 17 or 18 years old. It's still going to be 10 years before he's in osteopathic school. Once he finds a high spot or a low spot, he either fixes it in this chase or he has to fix it on the backing on the press. So from, I'm gonna show you the presses he used in a minute, but this is haptic perception at its best when you can feel size differences in this. Not movement, we're not talking about movement in the area. Now, in the middle of all the, um, a newspaper work, he decided he wanted to go back to university. And I'm not sure how many of you know, but he chose a university in Iowa, which was not too far away, maybe 100 miles, called Upper, Upper Iowa University. It's still there. And he took a, some basic, course, excuse me, basic courses, 
if you want to think of, of basics in Latin and Greek and ancient history. I don't, I don't know if anybody knows all the courses you took. Now, why in the world would you want to learn Latin and Greek and ancient history? So I'm going to answer that. Because if you wanted to go up in the ranks in the newspaper industry and be a proofreader or be an editor or a publisher, you had to know everything about everything. I mean, everything. You had to know all local politics, national politics, international politics, geography. You had to know literature, different languages. You had to know religion, different religion, because that was all part of verifying the story. And even as a compositor, um, in order to anticipate what word you were spelling or know if the word was being spelled right, you still had to know this stuff. So to me, and he doesn't say why he went, but to me, he was trying to go a little bit higher up in the uh, newspaper business. Now, he didn't finish this. He only went for one year. In fact, he didn't finish the full year. He went from September to April. He should have finished in May. Don't know why. Um, newspaper said he was sick, but don't know. I mean, there's just a lot that we don't know. He came back and rejoined the newspaper, and now he had his journeyman status. So the journeyman was a level of accomplishment in both compositing, meaning putting the letters in, and printing. So in printing, you had to know how to print, you had to know how to uh, fix the printers, how the printers operated, how to apply the paint, how to order the paint, not, not paint, ink, sorry. Now, if you just look at these kind of styles of uh, printing presses, already you're getting the idea that you had to pull levers. This was uh, the original kind of, even the Gutenberg style was a, a hand press. So the letters would go between these two layers. You'd pull a, a lever, it would lift up, it would press and lift up again, and you'd take the sheet out. So he worked with those kind. He worked with what's called a platen press. And unless you can see my hands, I can't really show you how it works. But there's more moving parts. And the print is bought, bought, bought brought, sorry, brought towards a plate. Now, in this case, and in the next case, the cylinder press, which is a little more advanced, all of these advances mean that you can print the paper faster. Um, if the letters weren't level at that 0.918, you had to adjust the backing that the letters went against. So you couldn't adjust the letters. Now you had to build up or lower the backing. So again, it's using your hand to feel levelness. And this is called a galley press. So this is a real quick and dirty way of taking the print that's in the locked up chase, putting it down, making one copy, just a single copy, and letting the proofreader look at it. And this you're going to see when you read contributions of thought, Sutherland's book that he said he saw the galley proofs, the galley proofs of Still's book on uh, philosophy and mechanical principles of osteopathy. The galley proof means that it went on this press called the galley, and he was responsible for reading it to make sure that whatever letters were taken out of the box and put into the galley and then the chase were exactly as the copy was. So he really saw Still's really raw work. And he did the same thing for Little John when he was in school. He was setting up the galley. So he had a part-time job setting up the galley for Little John's books. Uh, he continued on in this status as reporter, uh, sorry, as newspaper until um, 96 when he did become a reporter. So again, he's popping around just like his father did from different newspapers in Minnesota from place to place, not because he had bad luck, but now as a journeyman, 
you you had papers, you had union papers, you could go where you were needed, or you could go where you were wanted, because you pretty much were guaranteed a job, because there was always advertisements for journeymen. So this was great. He was settled, he had a career, he was a reporter, and he should have really been satisfied. He's 25, 24 years old. Uh, no girlfriend that we know of. Uh, no interest other than doing his job. Now, a number of reasons why he becomes interested in osteopathy. First of all, it's not going so great as a reporter. You're a little bit abused sometimes. You have to go into, um, let's say, a hotel to get news, especially in small towns. There is no news. So you go into the hotel, you look in the guest book to see if anybody new was in town, uh, and then you try and interview them. So he was a little bit abused um, by drunks. And then he had to write about topics that he didn't necessarily agree with. So his, his politics was Republican, but he had to write stories from a Democrat perspective. And he didn't really enjoy doing that. Ada says in Thinking Fingers that his younger brother um, needed osteopathic care, got it, and got better. So that could be another reason. Uh, one of the roommates he was hanging out with in Minnesota came from Kirksville and knew about osteopathy. So there was that. And then in 96, uh, Osteopathic College opened up in Minnesota, and he got to cover some of the osteopathic stories. And he was really befuddled or confused about why the MDs, the medical doctors, were afraid of osteopaths. So what are they afraid of? And this story may have caught the eye of Andy Taylor still. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but what happens next in March of 1897 is he quits the newspaper and his friend, who was from Kirksville, uh, and him go to Kirksville. His friend's name is Herschel. Herschel signs up for osteopathic school in the April start of the 1897. Um, Sutherland does not, and it's hard to say why. He seems to go there for four weeks or six weeks, I have no idea, and then come home. And come home was back in Mapleton now because the father had stopped moving around. What I didn't show you was he'd already gone to Washington State, which is on the Pacific Coast. He'd gone to Wyoming to sell insurance. He got really, really sick with yellow fever and had to be brought home um, delirious. So that whole side of the family was really messed up. Um, Will is a little bit of a isolated because he's just working with newspapers. What working in the newspapers gave him was a father figure because he didn't have one at home. The father was primarily more of Steve's father when he was home, the older brother, uh, and a lot of time he wasn't present. So Will lost his childhood, lost his adolescence, and went right from a youth to an adult when he became a dentist. Yet he had none of that. So he went home back to Mapleton, and we really not sure what he does for an entire year, and maybe a little bit longer. But then in September of uh, 1898, he goes to Kirksville to join the program, and he gets a full scholarship, meaning he didn't have to pay to attend. And we think, I think, he didn't have to pay because Bill was in the habit of awarding scholarships to people who promoted osteopathy in the news. So there's a couple of evidences that somebody else had done that. A couple of people had done it before. So we think that, I think, that Andrew, uh, that William Garner Sutherland had done the same thing, although I can find no printed evidence of that. But he gets a scholarship and he spends his two years there. Now, what you want to know about those two years, I don't know. 
it would take me two years to tell me what happens in two years. So the program is four terms of five months. It starts in September. The first term ends uh, in January of 1899. He's got 180 or so people in his class. State of the art building, 80,000 square feet building, four story high, uh, electricity, water, plumbing throughout, uh, decorated. Like compared to the rest of the US, this was a really classy building in the American School of Architecture. Um, very, very good instructors at the time. All the little Johns were there, William Smith was there, McConnell was there, Hazard was there. So the best instructors. However, the instructors went uh, in and out like um, a revolving door, uh, especially the, the sons. So the sons were Harry, um, Herman, and Charles Hill. Hildreth was there, and he was kind of in and out meaning they would um, set up a practice somewhere, they would sell a practice, they would go on a little jaunt to promote osteopathy, they'd come back, they'd go promote it in the legislation to make it legal and they would come back. So there was this revolving door of instructors and that was in the first and second terms. Um, he comes back for the second year in the, let me just see, no, I should tell you, in April of his third, in April of the second term, uh, there was a, if you haven't heard, a really nasty, nasty tornado that hit Kirksdale. It killed three, 35 people, that's a little town. Uh, left destruction everywhere. Some of the professors were eyewitnesses. One of the people in Will's class was killed. Uh, another one lost his wife, and either the mother or either the baby daughter reports uh, are not consistent on that. But there was quite an upheaval. Bill gave back the tuition to anybody who was, uh, to the family of anybody who was killed. All the students were part of the cleanup, but still, I mean, small as um, William Garner Sutherland says nothing about this. He just doesn't write anything about himself. Nothing. So he comes back in the third term and does his schoolwork. And in the fourth term, he endures it and now the teachers are really really going in and out the little johns are pouting and upset smith is pouting and upset smith gets fired smith sets up a business right in the middle of um, kirksville i don't know how andrew taylor still put up with all this i really don't know how he did it but sometime within that chaos william garner sutherland walks into if you've read your work, you know the North Hall and sees the disarticulated skull. Do I have a picture of it? Oh, there's the ASO. He walks into, I hope you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yes, there? we can see it. He walks into this part of the building, which is no longer there. It's gone. It's called the North Hall. So it's not a, a hallway, but in there, on the north wall, and the north is down here, the north wall over here, is a, a floor to ceiling display case with glass doors of natural history specimens, including a disarticulated skull from Paris. So I suspect he's alone in here because they didn't have classes all the time. And he seems to, um, in later descriptions, say he was by himself. The room was 2,400 square feet. I think you have to divide by nine to know how many square meters that is. Because there's, yeah, divide by nine, and I think you know how many square meters. 
and there's a big statue of Andrew Taylor still on the opposite wall that's sitting right in front of the window, looking like Abraham Lincoln is backlit. So now you can imagine now he's in this monster's room, looking at this disarticulated skull, still is looking at him, and it's two floors high. So the, it's the ceiling. The ceiling is part of the room. So it's just this enormous room. And there's what he sees. And he looks right at this part right here. And that's where the famous expression, doubled like the gills of a fish, indicating articular mobility for a respiratory mechanism. That thought gets stuck in his mind for the next 53 years, for the entire remainder of his life. Um, the first part is, that's impossible. I can't, I can't even think about that. Nobody would agree with me. Uh, everyone says the skull is solid. Um, and really tries to not, not think about the pink elephant in the room for 10 years. So he's got this in his mind. He's studying for his finals. He graduates with everybody, um, including um, the Little Johns, who were there to get their diploma, even though they had already set up before he graduated, they had to set up their school in Chicago. So the Little John story is very complicated. What kind of diplomas they got, um, whether they wrote any exams, unlikely whether they studied, unlikely whether they took any courses, maybe not. That's another, another entire whole story. And you can read, um, there's a few books on, on Little John already. Uh, John Warner's book, John O'Brien's book, and Chris Campbell's book, which I haven't read yet. But there's there's still more to that. So I don't actually have anything else to say because this is the early part of how we got to this place at this time. So Raymond Dobb, pass it back to you. Well, the thank thank <laughs> thank you for 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 the nice presentation. I, I, re I really like the idea that uh, he learned to palpate when he was doing typesetting. Maybe we should include that in our training. <laughs> um, can I try and show you a video? Sure, let's get adventurous. Let's, let's, let's try. Um, you, would, you would have to. Share that. Yeah. It's only eight seconds long, but it's one of the presses working, and I want to see what you think when you see it. You yes, lovely. What do you see? Well, I see a machinery with gears. Do you see a wobbly wheel? Yes. Let me play it again now that you look for the wobbly wheel. So it looks like it's wobbly on purpose. It's wobbly on purpose. So it's, it's, that was not necessarily, I don't know if he used that type of press, but those are the things that we saw everything working as a mechanism. Mm -hmm. You can't take one of those gears off and have that press work. Yeah. Right? So from the beginning, working with this kind of mechanism gave him the mechanical aptitude. That's the word I'm looking for, mechanical mm -hmm. aptitude to see this mechanism in play. And then the haptic skills in the hands. And think about, think about the Greek and Latin also when we're going to study from Martin mm -hmm. Little John, who knew Greek and Latin, right? You got all the advantages. You mature, you're 25 years old, and you're going to the American School of Austria. No, really interesting. And the, the, the typesetting reminded me of the haptic pads that, that are used for, for haptics research nowadays. You know that? Yeah, you've, you've seen those? Where you, where you learn to palpate diff uh, reliefs uh, if, of, 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 uh, of a different height to find out the threshold that you are able to palpate. Mm. Turns, out, turns out this has existed 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's why I got no history. It's always been done. So there are no questions? Are there questions? I, I think there's no questions oh, kept coming in from the from the audience tonight. Uh, maybe a question, question to you. Why does the book end there when when the osteopathic story begins? Will, will there be a part two? The part two is written in my head. <laughs> um, but this took on and off uh, 11 or 12 years to get Oh, there. really? <laughs> so if you want to wait until 2025, you know, probably longer. I mean, it'll be a long time if I want to do the same kind of mm. uh, work. You know I was really sick a few years ago and, and nearly died. I don't know how much longer I'm here. So do I sit on this forever and wait, hope that I finish? Mm -hmm. um, or do I get something out, get you interested, get you reading um, Sutherland and prepared for when the rest of the story mm -hmm. comes out? And I'm still only doing biography. I'm not going to try and at least at this stage now explain why he was doing what he was doing. Only um where i suppose mm -hmm. and you, you're going to meet his um cranial faculty all of them are very important to his development and there's a switch as you most of you should have noticed by now from when he's really purely mechanical to when he goes from the mechanics to what is driving the mechanics mm -hmm. okay. so What's the energetic body? What's the fuel? What's the force? What's the liquid light? Whatever the whatever it is, that that's in the second part of his investigation. Something happened around 1940 yeah. to 44, somewhere in there. I'm still digging into that. Lots of potatoes uh, to find out what happened. But in a switch, it was switched over. Mm -hmm. That, 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 that's the part of the story that Jim Jealous likes to tell. Sutherland's development from a very mechanical model and very mechanical thinking to a very spiritual perspective in, in towards the end of his life. Would you yeah. also describe it that way? Um, I could say that he was evidence of a spiritual nature from about 1902, which is almost 40 years before he goes, mm -hmm. applies it to his work. But he had that, um, he had that side to him. And I think it just developed more as he started meeting the cranial family. So the more he had something to, some people to interchange with, the more he said, it. Mm -hmm. the more it became okay to talk about it, the more he had people to talk about it, and the more he developed it. I think the fear, not the fear, but the, the concern is um, we're expecting students at a very early age to understand that approach, which he took 40 to 50 years yep. to reach. And the, the, the purely mechanical stuff, which we don't teach, honestly, we don't, because I've, I've dug into it and that's what I, uh, that's what I do teach is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he used it in cases of influenza. And gosh, I'm sitting here with my hands tied, not able to treat a single person with mm -hmm. COVID that are having these kind of similar mm -hmm. symptoms. And yet suddenly we went through the whole thing and, and um, I was treating them just like everyone else with success, but not, not with the same approach that the standard um, literature would say, like the rib raising, he didn't do anything like that. Would, would, that would, 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 would you want to talk, talk about his particular approach for another five minutes or so? Yeah, his approach. Mm -hmm. um, what did he do? Was, this is how he came with his first cranial uh, technique, was through treating people with influenza. He looked at something called anterior tensity, and Tensity is not an English word, really, but if you think of it like density, so you have dense and density, tense and tensity, it's a state of tenseness. So he saw anterior to the spinal cord as a state of tenseness. He saw that 
start in the deal. Um, I almost have, I can't do it without some um, slides and maybe you could do it another time, but I'm gonna ask you all, anybody who's listening now, especially if you're cranial heads, next time you sneeze or maybe the second time, because you usually don't remember the first time, don't let your sneeze out and try and feel what happens in your head. Pay really close attention and let it happen a few times. You will feel things in your head. And I think this is what started, um, maybe not him uh, trying to sneeze or witnessing sneezes, but he said it started in the nasal region with tensing of the dura membrane. I think he came this close to getting it. And I, I think if he just thought of about sneezing, if he just thought of that, he would have connected the dots. Because once you sneeze, you increase your intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. What, what's going to move? What's going to get tense? No. Are your membranes, because they're going to keep your head from blowing apart. Mm -hmm. and once you have tenseness in the membranes, then you have the possibility for venous stasis. Mm -hmm. Once you have venous stasis, then that, 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 it's a great big cascade of, of, uh, of events. But that would put tenseness in the dura, it carries down the, the spinal dura, and it, it created the tenseness anterior. So anytime that you get a rib raising, for instance, you're increasing the tension mm -hmm. rather than decreasing. So he did everything to release tension anterior from the, from the face, from the neck, from the mm -hmm. thorax, uh, diaphragm, so us. Interesting. So the muscles on the back, you hear them breaking up the muscles and yeah, yeah. out of the breaking up method, you wouldn't touch it because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're tense and now you can probably say it's a cytokine effect, but the muscles, the extensors contract more than the flexors because there are more extensors. There, there's no flexors on the front of the spine. So when you get the cytokine response and you get the contraction, you're going to go into that anterior tenseness. Mm -hmm. Really interesting mm -hmm. approach. Thank you. I think I think for that part, absolutely pure brilliance. Good, good. Anything else you think you you, you want to add? I'll think about it after the camera goes off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, will, will will the book be out in German? Is is there any any plans yet? Um. Uh, the Orlandis intends to translate it into German. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and then the finishing touches of um, the final edits and making map maps. And then my paper. I should take the uh, two of my own and believe for the rest of this. But this, these two months off, I thought I've been really working from about. 15 in the morning till quarter to nine at night every day. Wow. Mm. Trying trying to put the finishing touches on it. It's just like baking potatoes. <laughs> well, thank you that although you're in that critical period of your book that you took time for uh, to, to visit us in the cafe still point. Yeah, and you know, it's um, I look at that cafe and we'll never be the same again, right? Well, actually, actually, the, the cafes did open in Vienna two days ago. Yeah. And things are Can still... Can you sit beside each other? Pardon? Can you sit beside each other? Well, uh, f four adults are allowed per table. And the spacing between the tables, I think, should be at least a meter or two. Yeah. Which is which is okay-ish. It, it's still a little strange. The waiters are wearing masks, but the the, the customers don't have to. And you're working? Are you treating patients? Yes, treating yeah. patients. Yes, but we're we still we're still not sure when we will be allowed to start classes again. 
currently we are hoping end of May, but we don't have a definitive uh, permission yet. Yeah, and we're not treating it. I don't know when that'll start. Mm -hmm. So I can get back to work. Yes, <laughs> not not today, but tomorrow I will. And good good luck for for the last for the last meters on your book. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to 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 see it with all the with all the copyrighted photographs in it. Yeah, it's something else actually. Thank you very much, and okay. hope 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 to see you again in real life soon <laughs> yeah. when we're able to travel again. How do we turn it off? Do you do that? Oh, we, we we will do that. Don't worry about. It. Okay. Have a nice rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Und allen Zuhörern, Zusehern zu Hause, danke ich fürs Dabeisein, danke ich fürs Zuschauen. Es geht diese Woche weiter im Café Stillpoint am Mittwoch. Da kommt Raphael Zigarra Parodi zum zweiten Mal in der ersten Sendung vorige Woche, die einige von euch ja wahrscheinlich gesehen haben. Da ging es um Stills Verbindung mit den amerikanischen Ureinwohnern, mit den amerikanischen Indianern. Und um, um, und um die, die Hypothese, dass er vielleicht sein Konzept von Body, Mind, Spirit von indianischen Traditionen übernommen hat. Am Mittwoch, also übermorgen, wird Raphael noch einmal kommen und wird das Ganze weiterentwickeln und wird uns erzählen, wie vieles von dem, was indianische Schamanen seit einigen hundert Jahren praktizieren, wie das zusammenpasst mit moderner osteopathischer Praxis und was die modernen Neurowissenschaften in den letzten Jahren dazu entdeckt haben. Das ist das Programm für diesen Mittwoch. Nächste Woche wird es auch am Montag und Mittwoch ein Programm geben, das noch nicht genau feststeht. Wir halten euch auf dem Laufenden und schicken euch wieder einen Newsletter. Bis dahin bitten wir euch, es weiter zu sagen, dass es uns gibt. Bitte liked uns, sendet Tweets, teilt unsere Seite auf Facebook. Und vor allem kommt selber wieder vorbei am Mittwoch. Ich hoffe, wir sehen uns und wünsche euch einen schönen Abend. Bis dahin. Dankeschön.